The Civil War has raged for three years. On February 20th, 1864, the battle for Olusti will define Florida's role in the war between the states, with the Union anxious to regain the state and its resources, and the Confederacy fighting to hold on to them. This battle will end as one of the bloodiest in the war's history. Who will emerge the victor, left standing amidst the carnage of the battlefield? Can either side gain enough of an advantage in such an evenly matched battle? And will winning Florida turn the tide of the war? On the day South Carolina seceded in 1861, U.S. Major Robert Anderson and his small force of 85 soldiers were placed in Fort Moultrie along the Charleston Harbor. Anderson refused to surrender Fort Sumter to Confederate forces on April 11th and at 4.30 the following morning, the fort withstood a 34-hour shelling. The Civil War had officially begun. While Major Anderson was making a stand at Fort Sumter, Union forces landed near Pensacola, Florida, on April 12th to reinforce Fort Pickens. Soon, they were engaged in a months-long standoff against the Confederate Army. When it ended in May 1862, Fort Pickens was in Union hands and remained so for the duration of the war. The Northeast region of Florida fell that year, with Fernandina, St. Augustine, and Jacksonville now under Union rule. Florida sent 15,000 of its soldiers out of state to fight for the Confederacy, with about one-third failing to return by the end of 1862. The state, meanwhile, was having trouble providing its own military protection, and militias were spread thin. Even early in the war, as the Union managed to gain footholds throughout the state, the eastern part of Florida felt abandoned by the Confederacy that they had once been so fervent to join. With already dwindling resources, Florida's only defense had been a hastily assembled and ineffective militia. When the Confederate government took over all defense of the state in January 1862, this move abandoned the state-run militias left in the wake of Florida's soldiers who were leaving to fight out-of-state battles. More troops were sent to Tennessee from Florida not only the most geographically vulnerable of the states, being a peninsula, Florida was also the furthest away and had limited resources. As the Confederacy experienced the growing pains of its first year, Florida started to suffer under the strains of its own shortcomings. This was not lost on Major General Quincy A. Gilmore, in charge of the Federal Department of the South by 1864. A military engineer from Ohio, Gilmore became a national hero when he was key in the 1862 bombardment and eventual surrender of Confederate-held Fort Pulaski in Georgia. Gilmore's interest in taking over Florida was to not only exploit the state's resources, but also to cut those resources further from the Confederate Army to disrupt the rail service, and to recruit black soldiers into the Union cause. With an election year coming up, it was also desired to bring the disenchanted state back to the cause of the federal government. President Lincoln, in his December 1863 Reconstruction Proclamation, had even expressed a hope to see Florida return to the Union. With the passing of the Second Confiscation Act of July 17, 1862, the president was officially given power to recruit persons of African descent into the Union Army. 
By the end of the Civil War, the Union had held about 178,975 black soldiers, with over 99,000 of them from Confederate states. About 1,000 of those soldiers came from Florida alone. On February 4th, Gilmore commanded Brigadier General Seymour to dispatch a portion of the troops, mostly brought in from stations along the South Carolina coast, to Florida. At 39 years old, Seymour was a West Point graduate from Vermont. He had served in the Mexican and Florida wars and was present at the first Civil War action at Fort Sumter and received a promotion to Brigadier General in 1862. Wounded during his unsuccessful assault on Battery Wagner the prior year, he was coming into the Florida invasion after an absence from battle. Brash and aggressive, Seymour's reputation was that of a commander who won at great cost to his own men. The invasion of Florida would prove the accuracy of that reputation. The Confederate Army was quickly organizing from a small force into a formidable one, all due to the prescience of Brigadier General Joseph Finnegan. This 49-year-old Irish immigrant was in charge of the Confederacy's middle and east Florida districts. An established railroad operator in Florida prior to the war, Finnegan lacked the military experience of some of his counterparts. I am entrenched at the Ulysses tonight and have about 1,800 infantry, 450 cavalry, and two batteries and one section of artillery. It is hardly prudent to move forward against so large a cavalry force who can operate by forced marches in the night on my line of communication and perhaps cut me off from middle Florida by making a detour through the country and a sudden descent on the bridge over the Suwannee at Columbus, where I have but 30 men. I have no doubt that the commanding general appreciates the situation of affairs in this district and will make such provisions for its defense as the means of his command will allow. It is evident, however, that with the large and well-appointed force of the enemy, piloted by traitors familiar with every portion of the country, and knowing the position and strength of my command, the whole district will be ruined unless timely reinforcements are sent forward. On February 14th, Gilmore and Seymour meet in Jacksonville. Seymour's orders from Gilmore are clear. The Union Army is to focus on fortifying defensive measures in Baldwin, Jacksonville, and Barbers, rather than advance the forces further. After Gilmore's return to South Carolina, leaving the federal forces in the hands of Seymour, Seymour decided, against Gilmore's wishes, to advance towards the Suwannee River and destroy the railroad bridge. On February 17th, Seymour writes, the excessive and unexpected delays experienced with the locomotive, which will not be ready for two days yet, if at all, have compelled me to remain where my command could be fed. Not enough supplies could be accumulated to permit me to execute my intentions of moving to Suwannee River. But now, I propose to go without supplies, even if compelled to retrace my steps to procure them, and with the object of destroying the railroad near the Suwannee that there will be no danger of carrying away any portion of the track. All troops are therefore being moved up to Barbers, and probably by the time you receive this, I shall be in motion in advance of that point. Gilmore dispatches an officer to stop Seymour, but it is too late. Going west from Baldwin and to the Suwannee, we'll have Seymour and his forces passing Olusti and Lake City. In his hubris, he doesn't consider the alerted Confederate presence. After the Lake City skirmish, General Finnegan has moved his army to the most defensible position, the Illusti Rail Station. Ten minutes east of Lake City, Illusti features a narrow, dry corridor flanked by impassable swamps to the south and the large ocean pond to the north, the perfect spot for an ambush. There, Entrenched at Olusti, the Confederate Army waits in anticipation 
of the invading Union soldiers. Seymour departs with his three brigades, commanded by Colonel William Barton, Colonel Joseph Hawley, and Colonel James Montgomery, with support from Colonel Henry's mounted brigade and artillery. They hail from New York, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Amongst the body of troops are three outfits of black soldiers, the legendary 54th Massachusetts Infantry, one of the first black units, the 35th United States Colored Troops, who had not yet seen combat, and the completely new 8th United States Colored Troops, which also included white commissioned officers. As General Seymour's army leaves Barber Plantation for Lake City, numbering about 5,000 strong, they travel in three columns parallel to the railroad along Lake City and Jacksonville Road. Medal of Honor recipient Henry F. W. Little of the 7th New Hampshire recalled that morning. At daybreak, we quietly fell into line and at once crossed the southern fork of the St. Mary's River and started for the front. Halting for a few moments, only as we gained the turnpike across the branch, to allow a battery of flying artillery to gallop past. The sky was cloudless, and as the sun appeared, it warmed up the chilly atmosphere of the early morning. It proved to be one of those beautiful Floridian days, known only to those who have experienced them in the Everglade country. It is early afternoon when the advance guard started skirmishing with Southern horsemen. Colonel Carraway Smith, of the Confederate Cavalry Brigade was sent forward to apprise the invading Federal Army. I discovered the enemy about four miles distance from our encampment, occupying and forced the second crossing of the railroad from Olusty. I immediately reported this fact and directed Colonel Clinch to advance a body of skirmishers from which the regiment was to attack the enemy's pickets, which he did promptly and was pushing the attack earnestly when they were met by a much larger force from the enemy, which compelled them to retire to their horses. This they did in good order. The enemy then moved forward with his whole force skirmishing on our rear, which we resisted on our rear guard, keeping him in check. While the cavalry retired in line and in perfect order, the skirmishing was kept up until we reached the first crossing of the railroad from the Lusty. As Seymour's army pushes forward, the Southern resistance intensifies. What starts as a skirmish will soon erupt into a major battle. It is about 3 p.m. on February 20th, 1864. Finnegan sends more troops into the breach under the command of Colonel Colquitt on the field, perhaps realizing that the enemy will not make it far enough to the Alusti ambush. They settle about two miles from Olusty Station. The battleground emerges as a circular patch of level ground, pine covered, and with a diameter of roughly two thirds of a mile. It is to the east of Ocean Pond and north of the railroad tracks that run east to west. Unlike Finnegan's intended ambush spot, this puts both sides on relatively even footing. The battle will depend solely on the strength and strategic might of each army. The Battle of Olusti is now underway as General Seymour sends forward more men, including the 7th Connecticut, the remainder of Hawley's Brigade, the 7th New Hampshire, and the 8th United States Colored Troops. A blunder with the 7th New Hampshire, will give the Confederate Army enough of an advantage to tip the scales in their favor. It is very likely a mistake that affects the turn of the battle. General Hawley's orders are either incorrect or misunderstood, and the regiment scrambles 200 yards of the front line amidst gunfire. Henry F. W. Little of the 7th. An order was then given by General Hawley to deploy column on the 5th Company, which was the color company. Colonel Abbott, repeating the order clearly and distinctly, 
ordered the battalion to face to the right and left. When General Halley, finding himself wrong, said, on your eighth company, Colonel Abbott, when again seeing his mistake, the general said, on your 10th company, sir, all the companies, except the 10th, having already faced to the right and left, were marching to get into line as though deploying on the 5th company. And under the successive change of orders, the companies who were trying to deploy into line became badly embarrassed. And being under terrific fire from the artillery and infantry of the enemy, and the wrong orders having been given and obeyed upon the instant, and the maneuver having been partially executed before the correct order reached them, the battalion had become so badly mixed that it could not be reformed. Although those broken masses of troops bravely stood their muskets. According to Colonel Hawley, somebody must have misunderstood the order, for a portion of the regiment was going wrong. When myself and staff and Colonel Abbott repeated it vigorously, but vainly, all semblance of organization was lost in a few moments, save with about one company which faced the enemy and opened fire. The remainder constantly drifted back, suffering from the fire which a few moments decision and energy would have checked, if not suppressed. According to Little, the old weapons given the men compound the mistake. But the mistake of our commanding officers could not then be remedied. The ground was becoming thickly dotted with the bodies of the fallen. Yet those brave men faced to the front and what execution was possible under the circumstances. Although the whole left wing was armed with those same old muskets which had been exchanged, some of the mounted troops attached to the command had been completely spoiled for effective use at a time like this. The broken column, which had now lost one third of its entire number, only gave way when a portion of the color brigade was brought up in splendid style and filled the space. With the disarray of the seventh, the inexperienced eighth is even more exposed to Confederate fire. Enlisted with the 8th is Lieutenant Oliver Norton. After the war, Norton will write two books on his experiences in the Civil War. He joined the 8th on November 10, 1863. His recollections of Olusti provide a unique perspective on the role of black troops in the Union Army. In a letter to his father, Norton states, We were double-quicked for half a mile, came under fire by the flank, formed line with empty pieces under fire, and before the men had loaded, many of them were shot down. They behaved as anyone acquainted with them would have expected. They were stunned, bewildered, and as the balls came hissing past or crashing through their heads, arms, and legs, they curled to the ground like frightened sheep in a hailstorm. The officer finally got them to firing, and they recovered their senses somewhat. But here was the great difficulty. They did not know how to shoot with effect. When we were flanked, flesh and blood could stand it no longer, and Colonel Fribley without orders gave the command to fall back slowly, firing as we went. He fell, shot through the heart very soon after that. Where was our general and where was our force? As the 8th Colonel Fribley dies and Major Burritt has both legs broken, they are left without leadership. Third in rank, Captain R.C. Bailey rallies the fighting regiment amidst the chaos and the carnage. Officers should know exactly what to do, you may say. Well, certainly. But it is a damper on that duty when there is a certainty on the mind that the commander does not know. When, with eight or ten regiments ready, you see only two or three fighting and feel you are getting whipped from your general's incompetency, it is hard to be soldierly. The Eighth fight valiantly, but suffer more than 300 casualties. As they are forced to retreat, the Confederates gain the upper hand on the battlefield. General Colquitt brings the Confederate forces to bear down and advance across the battlefield. With the addition of Finnegan's reinforcements and the support of Colonel Harrison, Colquitt pushes the mile-long force 
running from north to south, down onto the enemy. General Seymour orders Colonel Barton's New York Brigade forward, and they manage to stop the advance and level out the battle lines. As soldiers on both sides of the unprotected battlefield continue to fall, the Confederates once more gain the tactical advantage when they secure Union artillery and turn them against their invaders. Some feel the armament's close proximity to the Confederate forces left the operators more vulnerable to the encroaching Confederate army. Colonel Barton brings his three regiments, the 47th, 48th, and 115th New York, into three parallel lines, filling the fateful void left by the 7th and 8th earlier. By battle's end, Colonel Barton's brigade suffered a loss of 811 men. Colonel George P. Harrison, Jr. of the 32nd Georgia Infantry recalls what could be a fatal shortcoming for the Confederate Army. It was whispered down the line, particularly in the 6th and 32nd Georgia regiments, that our ammunition was failing and no ordnance train in sight. With a shortage of ammunition, the tide can easily turn in the Union Army's favor. Desperately, Confederate soldiers even search the bodies of fallen comrades for spare ammunition. This I immediately reported to General Colquitt, who urged that we hold our ground, stating that ammunition would certainly reach us directly. This, I'm proud to say, was heroically complied with by my command, many of them for 15 to 20 minutes standing their ground without a round of ammunition. Harrison dismounts his horse and, gathering as much help as he can, orders staff and couriers to assist him in personally bringing forth ammunition from a train car that was half a mile distant. By several trips, they succeeded in supplying sufficient ammunition to our line to enable the reopening of a rapid and effective fire, before which the enemy had commenced to retire slowly, still keeping up their fire upon us. Harrison's quick thinking and the simultaneous arrival of reinforcements cement the Confederacy's advantage. General Colquitt pushes the two battalions to partly advance through the center of the battle line and buy time for the rest of the army to reload. General Seymour takes advantage of the ammunition shortage to introduce a new element to the battlefield. By four, the 35th Colored Troops and 54th Massachusetts Infantry, commanded by Colonel James Montgomery, are brought onto the scene. Rushing from the railroad back east of the battlefield, Montgomery's men drop any extraneous gear for the sake of speed and leave a trail of knapsacks and gear in their wake. They are met with the carnage that is fast becoming the Battle of Olusti. One soldier from the 54th recalls. When we got there, we rushed in double quick with a command from the general right in the line. We commenced with the severe firing, and the enemy soon gave way for some 200 yards. Even though the Union forces are losing the battle, the addition of the 497 men and 13 officers temporarily stagger the Confederates. Where it first appears that the Union forces are establishing a defensive posture, it is actually to provide cover for a strategic withdrawal. Colquitt, his army's ammunition restocked, aggressively advances his forces towards the Union Army. By sending the 6th and 32nd Georgia regiments toward the Union's right flanks, and the 6th Florida already moving likewise on the left flank, Colquitt shapes the battle line into a concave form that covers the Union Army on the center and the sides. Pushing forward with great vigor upon the center, the whole line moving as directed, the enemy gave way in confusion. We continued the pursuit for several miles when night put an end to the conflict. Instructions were given to the cavalry to follow closely upon the enemy and seize every opportunity to strike a favorable blow. 
as General Seymour starts the long retreat back to Jacksonville, the 54th Massachusetts, Federal Cavalry, and remainder of the 7th Connecticut kept the Confederate Army at bay. Darkness starts to descend behind the pine trees at 5.30, and the 54th prepare to disperse, giving false cheers to effect the arrival of reinforcements they retreat in a line and fire back behind them every two to 300 yards. Soon, they join up with Seymour's forces. Finnegan orders Colquitt to pursue the fleeing Union Army, but is convinced otherwise by the general. It is Colonel Smith's cavalry that apparently fails to apprehend the retreating enemy. The battle is now over, with each side evenly matched at 5,000 men each, the Union suffered 203 killed, 1,152 wounded, and 506 missing for a total of 1,861. The Confederates suffered 93 killed, 847 wounded, and six MIA for a total of 946, nearly half that of the invading forces. The entire battle lasted for about three and a half hours. It will go down as the Battle of Ocean Pond to some, but also as the Battle of Olusti to others. Perhaps the most stirring account of the black soldiers was given by a soldier of the eighth. Here, we stood for two hours and a half under one of the most terrible fires I have ever witnessed. And here, on the field of Alusti, was decided whether the colored man had the courage to stand without shelter and risk the dangers of the battlefield. And when I tell you that they stood with a fire in front, on their flank and in their rear, for two hours and a half without flinging, and when I tell you the number of dead and wounded I have no doubt as to the verdict of every man who has gratitude for the defenders of his country, white or black. In 1909, Florida acquired the Olusti Battlefield Memorial after the United Daughters of the Confederacy spent 12 years raising funds for it. Completed in 1912 and dedicated on October 23rd, the memorial's dedication brought in more than 4,000 people. The Florida Board of Parks and Historic Memorials assumed responsibility of the site in 1949, at which point Olusti became the state's first park. The Olusti Battlefield Citizen Support Organization, working with the Florida State Park Service and the Blue-Gray Army, stages a yearly reenactment Starting at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville in 1964, the Alusti reenactment moved to the state historic site in 1977. This reenactment of a legendary battle is the largest annual reenactment in the southeastern United States, with reenactors traveling the country over to relive history. 2014 marks the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Alusti. The best way to experience this history is to see it come to life every February and to walk where many brave men fought.